Good morning, and thank you, Jay. Um, and thank you, Bruce, uh, for this wonderful uh, uh, symposium. So these are exciting times for uh, targeting the PIC Canis uh, pathway in, in cancer. Uh, this is a pathway that, as Bruce has mentioned, has been extensively discussed over the last uh, few days. And the reason uh, why it's perhaps so prominent uh, is because it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it plays a role in, in a large majority of, uh, of tumors that we deal with, and in particularly has a clear role in breast cancer. This pathway is apparently activated in a large proportion of breast tumors. Uh, the mechanism by which this pathway becomes apparently activated, um, uh, there are multiple mechanisms, so it can be uh, uh, HER2 overexpression for one. It can also be uh, mutations at several sites of the PI3 kinase gene itself, uh, P10 deletion, AKT mutations, uh, etc. So, um, so, and I think it's probably true that whenever a pathway is frequently mutant in cancer, is that, it play, is that it plays a, a, a driving role, and that's the case. Um, the, the roles of the PSC kinase uh, pathway are multiple. Uh, they control uh, the input from many of the receptors. Uh, they control uh, cell metabolism and, and many other functions. So uh, again, a, a critical uh, pathway in many respects. The way I become interested in the PI3 kinase uh, pathway uh, was because uh, a few years ago when we were working exclusively on anti 2 therapies, uh, we began to realize that uh, there were a proportion of tumors that overexpress HER2 that were not responsive to anti 2 therapies. And this uh, happened in the clinic and there were a number of papers uh, published in that regard. And in the lab, uh, this was something that was easier to demonstrate. So initial work by the group uh, of um, René Bernard uh, in the Netherlands Cancer Institute showed that very clearly. And actually in our group, uh, a, a postdoc that had been with René in the past, uh, Pete Einhorn, uh, began to work on this as well. And the data were extremely consistent uh, in the number of labs that were addressing this issue. So namely, uh, those cell lines that were engineered to overexpress um, the uh, active mutations of PI3 kinase were resistant to anti HER2 therapies. And uh, you have here data uh, both with um, testuzumab, <coughs> with testuzumab, in which you can see the cell lines with these active mutations are resistant, and also with these small. Uh, Tyrosin kinase inhibitors such as lapatinib. So this was our entry uh, uh, point, uh, if you wish, into this uh, field. But then we immediately realized the tremendous opportunity that it provided as a potential uh, um, a place to develop uh, therapies against. And today we have a number of approaches to target the PIV kinase pathway, uh, ranging from PIV kinase inhibitors itself to AKT inhibitors to mTOR inhibitors and then to a combination of them. Just for, um, just uh, what I'll do is I'll go by chronological order. When we began to be involved in this, the only compounds that were available uh, for clinical trials uh, were the Rapalogs, and we began to work with Everolimus. And I will not show you the phase one data, uh, although I'll refer to some of the uh, findings that we found later on. But I think what we observed, and that was quite interesting, is that uh, Everolimus, which is a Rapalog uh, that as you know, blocks mTOR1 function, so it's not a good blocker of mTOR2. Um, so uh, Eperolimus uh, had some activity in breast cancer, but not much. Uh, this is the base data that you will find um, in, in, in breast cancer with Eperolimus. This is data from the NCIC Canada. So if you have if you guys are from any drug company and want to have a positive trial, go to Canada, uh, because this data has not been reproduced by any of us. But again, even uh, in a very uh, good setting, uh, the response rates that were observed were very minimal. So this is data from, again, from Elart et al, and showing that they had uh, a very uh, a small number of partial responses. Interestingly, uh, some of the clinical investigators dealing with Everolimus had the feeling that some patients actually got worse uh, when we treated them with Eperolimus. Um, and I don't know if Neil, uh, I wasn't here when Neil gave his talk, but Neil has experience in prostate cancer in which some patients did get worse on, on Eperolimus as if you were activating other pathways uh, that render the cells not only resistant but actually activated upon blockade. So this data on the activity and then uh, another important uh, component of this trial uh, 
is the fact that the responses that they observed, and this is a busy table, but just focus to the uh, CR and PR, complete remission and partial response, and the responses were seen basically in those patients that were uh, ER positive. So we're beginning to see a few things that are interesting. Hyperolimus has little activity, and activity is seen uh, in this subset in patients that were ER positive. So I think what's happening here, and, that's, and, and we have some clinical data to support it, is that there is a profound crosstalk uh, between the estrogen receptor and mTOR signaling. And there are several lines of evidence in support of that. The first thing uh, that we know is that uh, mTOR activates ER uh, signaling in a ligand-independent fashion. So all these ligand-independent mechanisms of ER activation, uh, uh, you know, many of them go through mTOR. So that's point number one. Now, point number two, in the lab, if you... Um, treat cells that are uh, ER positive with an mTOR inhibitor, okay? You see, you may see apoptosis. Now, that apoptosis is rescued, and that's work from Mike Ellis at uh, WashU. That apoptosis is rescued if you provide estradiol. So ligand-dependent receptor activation might rescue apoptosis induced upon mTOR blockade. So that speaks for that interaction. The third point of, um, here that I'd like to mention is that uh, in clinical samples and in uh, cell lines, and this is data from Carlos Artiaga's group and others, hyperactivation of this pathway is observed in endocrine resistant cells and also in some tumors. So I think if you put all this together, mTOR plus an AI blockade perhaps is the way to go forward. And that's exactly what we uh, proposed and what we did. So, this would go like this. You block with an AI alone, and that may be insufficient in situations where you may have uh, strong uh, PI3 kinase mTOR uh, uh, signaling that leads into ER, uh, into ligand independent ER transcription. So that's situation number one. Number two, if you block mTOR signaling and you leave uh, estradiol dependent receptor signaling undisturbed, that it's overcome and you still have ER transcription. So perhaps the way to go forward and what we propose is that you have to block the two pathways at the same time. And in order to prove this, we conducted a uh, randomized neoadjuvant study in breast cancer. Why, why neoadjuvant? Uh, in breast cancer, we need to be able, and breast cancer and many other tumors, we need to have biopsies to see what's going on. And it is very hard to do these studies in patients with advanced disease. Uh, they, are not, they are not homogeneous. It is difficult to get, you can get some biopsies, but you cannot get 200 biopsies. So we have been implementing for the last few years uh, neoadjuvant approaches to new drug development, and it has been extremely fruitful. And, and in this case, what we did is that we uh, uh, patients that uh, had ear positive early breast cancer were randomized to receive AI, electrosol, an androgen inhibitor by itself, plus placebo, versus um, the same dose and schedule of the AI plus Everolimus, also known as RAD001. And the primary endpoint of the study was to look at response rate, but even more important was to look at tumor biopsies on day 15 and compared with the pre-therapy biopsies and see what was happening at the level of proliferation. The study was positive, so we observed more responses on the Everolimus arm. But to me, the most interesting uh, thing is looking at the decrease of proliferation measured by Kia 67. In this graph, and what we have here is um, those tumors that have very low proliferation when we look at them. So in basal samples, you have this uh, uh, distribution, which is the classical distribution of proliferating tumors. So you have some tumors that have very high proliferation and some that have a very, um, uh, 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 very low. Day 15, on AI alone, you have about 30% that have undetectable levels of KC7, and you double that. You double that when you add Everolimus. So this was a very strong indication that this was going to be um, uh, synergistic in, in, in the clinic uh, in support of the, um, in support of the uh, preclinical work. 
we launched a phase three study that, as you know, phase three studies in breast cancer take a long time to, 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 um, to be enrolled and to be designed. And when we were fully enrolled with our phase three study, and you'll see the data in a minute, uh, we were extremely anxious about uh, whether the trial will, was going to be positive or not. And we got a very positive psychological boost, although the trial was already finalized, our trial, when uh, last year uh, there was a small phase two randomized trial reported, that's the TAMRAT study. So these were in patients that uh, had uh, postmenopausal disease, uh, ER positive, and they were treated with tamoxifen plus minus everolimus. All these patients had received a prior AI. And this study was very positive. Again, small study, but very positive. Look at the hazard ratio, 0.53. And um, so we felt good. We said, you know, maybe our study is going to be positive as well. And that's the design of our study, and that's the Bolero 2. That's a registration study in patients with metastatic disease, 700 patients, randomized 2 to 1 to an AI. In this case, was an steroidal AI, uh, extramestane, plus placebo versus everolimus extramestane. Why do we do two to one? This is something that we increasingly do in our clinical trials. We want to make sure that a higher number of patients get exposed to the experimental arm, especially uh, if you have a suspicion that it might be better, and it's absolutely fine to do it. So this facilitates enrollment and makes also uh, the protocol more interesting. And the primary endpoint of the study was progression-free survival. Also, we had overall survival, bone markers, which is very interesting, but I will not have time to talk to you about this, safety and PK. Patients were stratified uh, based on the prior sensitivity to hormone therapy or visceral disease. And importantly, there was no crossover allowed because we want to see what's happening with survival. And um, the primary endpoint of the study okay, was to have a 26% reduction. That's a hazard ratio of 0.74. So we would have been happy, actually very happy, if the study would have shown us a hazard ratio of 0.74, which is a very reasonable endpoint in a randomized phase three study. In order to do that, we needed this number of events. And importantly, uh, the study had one interim analysis when 60% of the events occur. And this interim analysis, um, they are very stringent. Uh, in order to, for a study to be called positive by the pre-specified interim analysis, they have to cross a very stringent uh, 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 boundary as, as described by, by Fleming, and that's the pre-value. So it's, it's not easy, it's not stringent. Um, but anyway, the good news is that the Independent Data Monitoring Committee um, let us know on February 11 that uh, these pre-specified boundaries have been met. So the study is final. I mean, the data is absolutely final. And that's what we got. So the primary endpoint of the study by local assessments, by local investigators, uh, was progression-free survival. And we went from 2.8 to 6.9 months, and that's a hazard ratio of 0.3. Uh, you have here more zeros that you can care for. Uh, there are uh, 15 zeros uh, on the p-value. I know that statistically, after more than three zeros, it doesn't matter. But boy, it makes you feel good to have all these zeros there. Uh, that's because of lack of knowledge. Um, and, and that's based on the uh, local review. And then the central review, uh, which usually is worse than the, cent than the local review, in this case, is even better. Uh, and uh, the hazard ratio here is 0.36. 10.6 months. There is not a single clinical trial in metastatic ER positive breast cancer that has this data. Uh, and, and this is possibly the most positive breast trial in this setting. And I think that's, that's quite exciting for the field because, again, this is an imperfect compound. I mean, you know, I mean, this is nothing. I mean, it is like version 1.0 uh, of what is going to be uh, a much better number of, 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 of compounds. Who benefits from this? Uh, we did uh, sensitivity analysis, and we looked at different subgroups, and basically we saw benefit across the board. So it doesn't matter whether patients had visceral disease, it doesn't matter whether the patients had uh, prior sensitivity to hormones. So I think probably here, looking at this magnitude of the effect and looking at the fact that everybody benefits, uh, we have here perhaps a combination of luminal A's, luminal B's, I would think. So um, it's, it's quite uh, uh, uniform uh, across. And in this self-serving slide that uh, I've taken from Andre, Fabrice Andre, who discussed this at the ESMO meeting, uh, the point is that 
people will ask, how good is this data? Well, um, here Fabrice uh, put up some of the uh, classical um, targeted therapy uh, trials and look at the hazard ratio. And our hazard ratio is right there. So our trastuzumab trial that showed the hazard ratio of 0.51 and was the, what got Herceptin approved uh, is, 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 you know, ours is, is even better, 0.36. So I, I think this is, uh, if you have to put this in perspective, is something that uh, has, has uh, a lot of value. Now, uh, you know, so we have seen that there is a crosstalk between ER and mTOR, but there's also a lot of crosstalk between PFC kinase mTOR and other pathways. Uh, this is work uh, done with Neil Rosen, and uh, Neil is the one who um, began to look in cancer cells and looked that upon rapamycin therapy, there was an activation of up upstream AKT. And the basis for that is that upon blockade of mTOR, uh, there is a negative feedback loop that is S6K dependent that is released, and then IRS1 levels go up, and that activates signaling via the IGF1 receptor, which in turns to uh, increase AKT. That is the basis, I guess, for those patients that got worse. Uh, you could imagine that you're blocking mTOR, and in some patients you have an AKT activation that drives proliferation per se. So I think that has value. In clinical samples, we were able to see the same. This is data from our phase one study uh, done by Josep Tabernero at Valdebron, and you can see the equity inhibition in uh, two samples here, in two biopsies, pre-therapy and on therapy, so quite clear data. If IOS1 is the mechanism of activation of the feedback loop, what happens if we block IOS1 signaling with an antibody against IGF-1 receptor. And that's exactly what we did, and we didn't do it in the lab, yes, we did, but we also did it in, in patients. And this is data from uh, patients, or yes, published in CCR, uh, uh, showing uh, that we were blocking uh, uh, phospho IS one phospho KT, and phospho MAP kinase in patients treated with this antibody. So clearly, um, uh, this was a good thing. And then the other thing that is important is that um, there was some data, uh, and this is data from, from, from Merck, uh, showing that um, in, 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 in tumors that are, uh, these are multiple uh, cell lines, uh, here you have uh, ER expression, and, and here uh, you have the rustness uh, by a gene signature of the cells, and it shows also that uh, the dafrolimus uh, uh, is, 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 is the, um, another mTOR inhibitor is, um, also more active in cell lines that are luminal V. So again, suggesting that uh, this um, mTOR dependency may be more pronounced in ER positive cell lines as opposed to triple negative. And this is data from the Karolinska uh, uh, um, uh, showing that, uh, this follicle available, showing that le looking at levels of IgA1 receptor expression that is higher in tumors that are ER positive with a, a high growth proliferation index. So these are the the luminal Bs. And then data from Merck uh, that has not been published, uh, looking at enhancer screens, uh, no matter what the screen they do with DALO or with RIDA, uh, so with DALO, which is the IGFR antibody, um, uh, uh, every single time mTOR, FRAP1 mTOR is a top hit. And the same happens in the reverse. So uh, again, everything was getting together in supporting that there was also a crosstalk between IGF-1 receptor and mTOR. And we did a phase one clinical trial with the combination. This is a phase one with multiple doses, um, uh, skeleton doses, so not everybody got the right dose. And I think what's important in this phase one study is that we observed that 54% of the patients with ER positive high proliferation had some evidence of clinical response. And in many cases, this was a, 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 a partial response. So now we are doing a large randomized phase two study of this combination. We are seeing responses, and I think this could be yet another strategy. And this could be the only way, uh, at least in the near future, to get IGF-1 receptor antibodies into the clinic in breast cancer in combination with mTOR inhibitors. We are now moving ahead. We have a list of compounds. This is a partial list. This is just a list of the compounds for which we are doing clinical trials uh, that we are personally involved. So there are many more, of course. And as you can see, there are uh, different target specificities. So we have alpha inhibitors. We have beta sparing compounds, pan pfc kinase, pre kinase mTOR, mTOR catalytic, and AKT inhibitors. So we have a whole variety. Which ones are better? We have no idea. 
We have done some work uh, that I'll show you with one of the pan PFIC inhibitors, that's BKM120. That work is in press in JCO. And here in this study, what we did is that we had multiple tumor biopsies and we were looking at inhibition of downstream uh, from PI3 kinase and looking at phosphoase 6 and looking at phosphoase 8T in a number of patients. We did see inhibition, so we are blocking the pathway, there is no question. Uh, in the clinical trial, in the dorsalization phase, we did a PET scan uh, 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 um, companion uh, component. And something that is important is that in a majority of patients, we did see a PET scan. Uh, decrease, a PET-scan response, if you wish, a decrease in glucose uptake. Now, the important thing here is that in a proportion, in those patients that had a radiological response, and we'll see them in the next slide, all of them had a PET response up front. So one thing that one could envision is that we perhaps could use PET scans as a way to identify early on who's going to respond to this or not. And if you don't have a response by PET scan, say on day 15, the chances that you will respond to one of the decisions is, 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 is very limited. The other one is looking at the, in the dose selection phase, at the activity. So we had some activity, nothing to write home about, but we had some activity uh, seen with this compound. Uh, interestingly enough, the best response we had was in a patient that had breast cancer and had a KRAS mutation. And this is very different to the very poor performance of patients with colorectal cancer that had KRAS mutations and they do not do well. So maybe in breast cancer, a KRAS mutation that is very rare has a complete different functional meaning than in, than in, than in, uh, in colon cancer. Once we found the dose, and um, we had now an expansion cohort, and we are seeing activity in HER2 positive disease. This is a patient of mine with a major response by PET scan. And also, we began to see responses in ER positive disease. And here, um, you have a PET scan prior to therapy and on therapy, and then the huge response seen by, by, CT, by CT scan. You can even see that the liver is actually a little smaller in size because of the tumors uh, really uh, uh, decreased um, dramatically. The compounds that we're really excited about are these alpha-specific inhibitors. Uh, and we're working with the three of them. Uh, these are two alpha specifics, and this is a beta inhibitor. And we are excited for one reason. These are the first compounds that um, we see selectivity based on PI3 kinase mutational status. So this is work from Cyril Burns at the CMT, at MGH, and Novartis has the same data uh, working uh, together with the broad, with the cell line encyclopedia. And in those cell lines that have mutation of the PI3 kinase alpha, the sensitivity is much greater. Now, it's interesting the way clinicians and the way lab guys look at the same graphic. When we saw this data in the lab, our the clinicians in the group said, this is fantastic. We're going to be able to enroll patients with PI3 kinase mutations. The guys in the lab said, who are these guys? Uh, who are those that have sensitivity and are not having a PI3 kinase mutation? So what we said is, you guys figure this out. And in the meantime, and in the meantime if you don't mind, we we'll proceed with those. And, and that's what we are, uh, what we are, we're doing. So that's what we're doing. Okay. So we are enrolling into this trial. Um, from day one, we have entered patients that are PIT kinase mutation. This trial has been run by a fellow at MGH, Diane Jurik. He has enrolled more patients himself than anybody else in six, in six other sites around the world. And that speaks to the strength of the MGH fellows, right? Uh, and uh, we have uh, seen uh, responses uh, um, uh, in patients. So this is working clearly. And we also seen responses with our compounds. Now, uh, one last concept, and that's uh, something that Neil touched upon. Uh, I'm sure he did. And that's, um, so we have seen that you activate pathway uh, compensatory mechanisms when you block mTOR1. What happens when you block PI3 kinase? Well, the same, the same occurs. So in multiple cell lines, we have seen that when you block PI3 kinase, you have an increase in phosphor ERK. This is our two cell lines that are uh, HER2 positive, and this is not compound dependent. So we have taken P110 uh, inhibitors, P110 mTOR, AKT, mTOR catalytic, uh, sorry, mTOR1, I mean, mTOR catalytic, and in every single case, you have an increase in phosphor ERK. And in the case of HER2 positive cells, this goes along with phosphor HER2 activation. And uh, Neil and ourselves working together, we have shown that this is through a FOXO mediated upregulation of HER3. So there is a transcriptional increase in HER3 in addition to activation of HER3. And that basically in HER2 positive is what drives this uh, feedback loop. So you can envision several situations where you have an IGF1 R driven uh, uh, loop, a HER2 driven, and EGFR receptor driven, that's work 
um, that has been done by the group of uh, Jeff Engelman showing the same. So there's a consistency here. And I think what's exciting is that this gives us the opportunity to use combination therapies to block this activation. So you can see you could block HER2, HER3, or you could block ERK uh, 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 as well. We don't know what's better in the lab. It looks very similar. And in the clinic, we are doing the clinical trials together. Um, we're also working together uh, with uh, Jeff Engelman's uh, um, uh, group and Bill O'Han's group and the group in Barcelona in trying to identify mechanisms of resistance to PI3 kinase inhibitors. So we're trying to be ahead of the game uh, because we are convinced that these therapies will reach the clinic. So we have several strategies that I think for time purposes I'm going to skip. But basically um, we are beginning to have some hits uh, that make sense and, and, and that we are going to um, be able to identify in, in, in our patients as we, move, as we move along. So I think um, I'd like to leave you uh, to today is that um, this pathway clearly is important. We're beginning to see responses in patients. Uh, uh, the rapamycin analogs will clearly be part of therapy in ER positive breast cancer. People are talking about launching adjuvant trials. Uh, people are talking about doing first line settings. So that's going to change uh, and going to be a new standard, I'm, I'm sure, in ER positive disease. And that we have to then move in with the new, more specific compounds that are very exciting. Combinations is going to be the name of the game, combinations that are rational. So I am personally very excited about the anti ig one receptor and anti erc and then also uh, the combinations blocking PI3 kinase and HER2, and perhaps PI3 kinase and ERK as well. So I think um, we're going to be busy uh, in, the next, in the next few years. So I'd like to thank the people who have been uh, working uh, on this. In the picture, if you can see them, you have uh, Maury uh, Scaltriti, who's leading my lab, and he's here today. We have our super fellow, Diane. We have Pete Einhorn. Uh, this is the group in Barcelona that has done a lot of the work. Uh, this is Josep uh, Tavernero, and this is Jordi Rodon and Violeta. And the guys um, uh, here uh, that I'd like to acknowledge uh, is Neil Rosen and Sarat from Sloan Catering, uh, and, and then also uh, Jeff Engelman, uh, Seal uh, Benz, and uh, John uh, E.F. Freighty for all the work. And this is my funding. Thank you very much. Great talk, as always. Uh, just a question on the Bolero trial. So first of all, fantastic results, obviously very exciting. Uh, when you see a clinical trial result, particularly a phase three with a p-value with 15 zeros, obviously everyone runs for the champagne. Um, but it also makes you wonder, um, in the back of your mind, how overpowered was the study? And are we now, uh, should we start thinking about clinical trial designs that are much more adaptive so that that trial could have been done with 100 women and not 700 women as the data is maturing, because it would have been statistically significant with far less number of patients, but obviously you didn't know that when you designed it. So are we moving into that era in terms of adaptive designs that would decrease the number of patients needed for these trials? Yeah, so, yeah I, mean, I mean, you're so right. The, so I think the... Even the most optimistic uh, person would not have predicted uh, this, these results. Uh, I remember we had an advisory committee um, of the uh, people working in this, and the, this was a few months ago, and the whole theme of that meeting, talking about Bolero 2, was how to use the Bolero 2 samples to learn on how to use PI3 kinase inhibitors because the investigators had the feeling that Bolero 2 was going to be marginally positive. And at one point, I had to tell them, guys, could you please wait uh, and, and until we see the data? So this was unexpected, even for all of us. So that's one thing. Now, how do you... Now, if you do adaptive design in the metastatic setting, uh, it, I guess it's a balance of time and effort. Uh, so, I mean, how would you... How would you do that? Unless you get approval to, I think the only way you could get by by that is that if you could get approval to do studies like in the neo adjuvant setting, uh, if we could have a way to get approval there, and then then I think we'd be okay. But in the metastatic setting, I, I see it very hard because um, 
I see it hard. I don't know how I would do it because of the time sensitive nature of what of what we do. The, those samples you, you said the laboratory guys were going to pursue, did they ever find out what was different about those patients who were so sensitive? Right. So IGF-1 receptor plays a role there, clearly. So cell lines that express IGF receptor, yes. So that's one. And that's what we know for sure. And then, and that's, yeah. Could you select those patients for part of the trial? We, we could. But I think our obligation right now is that since the alpha-specific compounds are so clearly working on alpha-specific, I think if we could get that settled. Um, I think the idea is to get that concept proven, and then we're going to have the chance to, to work on the non-PIC kinase mutant. You, you mentioned uh, the possibility, I mean, the results are so striking, the possibility of using uh, an mTOR inhibitor or a pathway, PI3 kinase inhibitor, with uh, anti-estrogen therapy as primary treatment. Where does that stand? I mean, it seems so logical now that if you find it in resistant disease, you should, it Absol should be true. Absolutely. Out. So I think what needs to be done, and quite urgently, is to study this in the first-line setting, and then most importantly, in the adjuvant setting. I mean, you know, that would be, that would be, I mean, this would be like the end of chemotherapy for ear positive disease. I mean, this level of magnitude, and also it's important to realize that these tumors are not very responsive to chemotherapy. So I think that um, what's happening in the field is that we all very actively trying to come up with a very strong adjuvant design. And, and I think that's where this could play a role. And then, uh, even in prevention, right? But at this right. point, yeah. Right. Has that started yet? Well, the data were presented on the 26th of September. Uh, since, since then, I know that uh, we have six proposals on the table. Uh, it's not bad. We have like a proposal per, per week. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. No one plans for success, huh? <laughs>